Thank you, Malcolm, and thanks everybody for being here. In fact, there's a lot of people here, so it didn't look that obvious from there, but uh, nice turnaround. Okay, so as Malcolm was saying, uh, the focus of the talk, as far as I'm concerned, is going to be around the influence of oxygen on wine aroma development in the bottle. And I mean, as you see during the day, there's, a, there's various areas that are affected by oxygen as far as wine quality goes from a sensory point of view. But there is no doubt that in our experience, but I think in everybody's experience, the moment you have an opportunity to taste wines that have been exposed to different levels of oxygen, the aroma side of things is really responsive to oxygen exposure. So we can really create a variety of aroma styles, of aroma profiles, but just playing with oxygen. And if you link back to these two, what we heard before regarding the uh, wine competitions and the way judges have assess the quality of the wines, certainly some of these aroma attributes will fall into the fault category, so the be reduction or oxidation, so unpleasant characters. But one side that I want to uh, talk a little bit about today is also that in between these two extremes, there are actually different balance of the various sensory attributes that overall will bring out the nice side of the wine characteristics, some interesting aroma attributes, and a variety of uh, uh, subtle attributes that are really bringing out the difference that exists between different wines. So it becomes also an interesting approach in terms of creating your own style of wine and just uh, giving to your consumers a style of wine that the winemaker has in mind and that has thought about it. If we look at what consumers and media seem to be talking about all the time today, Certainly in terms of a red wine, from an aroma perspective, we hear a lot about berry flavors, red berry, dark berry, spicy chocolate. These are all attributes that seem to be quite, quite frequent in the wine media today in terms of good quality attributes. If you look about white wines, you see tropical fruits, citrus, exotic fruit, maybe some smoky characters, a bit of complexity, some dry fruits in some cases. So these seem to be the the sensory spectrum that we, the consumers seem to be dealing with today and seem to associate with good quality products, both consumers and probably journalists as well. But we also heard that um, if you take a wine competition like we heard before, we see reduction coming out quite often in something not very pleasant but still existing. And if you go more in depth, uh, people be talking quite often about astringent tannins that prevent uh, proper enjoyment of the wine from a mouthfeel perspective, wines that are not expressing their characters very well, and in the white wine, overall, a uh, reduction masking some of the fruity aromas. So that seemed to be quite happening more and more. And our experience is starting to show to us more and more through the trials that we do, and we're not the only one observing this trend, that these sensory features are very much linked to wines that are not receiving enough oxygen in the bottle. Now, at this stage of the presentation, I'm going to talk a bit in general about enough, not enough, too much. But later, we will look a bit more in detail about what is too much, what is not enough, how much is good. But strictly, uh, generally speaking, we see this happening more and more when wines are not receiving enough oxygen. So overall, this less oxygen seems to be preventing wines from expressing a variety of sensory attributes that are quite crucial to meeting consumers' expectations and successful judgments in wine competitions or in the press. So all things that the winemakers are typically chasing up. And a lot of these seem to be happening when the wine is receiving sufficient oxygen. But of course, you also want to be away from wines receiving too much oxygen, so from the problems of oxidation. So there seem to be a balance of things that we can chase by just tailoring the right amount of oxygen for the needs of the wine. And uh, starting with reduction, it's probably something that has been existing in the wine industry for a long time, but today, as the wine industry is moving more and more towards better management of oxygen and better management of closure, fermentation, winemaking in general more under control, we seem to be observing this, this type of issue more and more. Also, maybe just consumers and media becoming more responsive to it, but overall we see it more and more. From a chemical point of view, and that's the reason why I'm using this um, analogy to spaghetti western, 
The family of compounds that is involved in reduction has multiple phases. And in some cases, some of the compounds belonged into this same family. They're actually not as bad as we think they could be. Now, everybody knows these guys, right? Or <laughs> most of them have seen them somewhere on a movie screen or on a TV at some point. Some guys are good guys. Some others, some different characters, and some others are probably not the nice guys. Now, if you think about this from the perspective of the whole spectrum of different reductive attributes that you can have in a wine, you can go from something that's fruity varietal attributes. Imagine a Sauvignon Blanc with these nice passion fruit citrusy aromas. Now, we don't call that reduction, but you see it's connected here. So these are the good guys. Think about some wines that express some complex minerality, some roasted smoky aromas. They're probably still good guys. Think about some wines that are expressing some cabbagey aromas. Some people might live with that, but it's not as good anymore. Think about rotten. Most people won't like to have them in their glass or in their bottles. So these are the bad guys. From a chemical point of view, there's a, a little list of compounds that we can associate, some with more certainty, like the mercaptoexanol, strictly, very closely linked to these attributes. These guys are very much known as the bad guys. In between here is a bit more complicated, but there seems to be evidence that some of these compounds are playing a key role there. Now, the interesting thing is that although their chemical structures can be quite different, overall, they all have part of their chemical structure incorporating a moiety that contains a sulfur atom bound to a hydrogen atom, so what we call a SH moiety, SH function, or a thiol function. So these compounds, they all share this property. And from the point of view of the way they behave in a wine in response to oxygen exposure, this will make them very similar. So by playing with oxygen, you'll be really able to affect the chemistry of these compounds because of the presence of this function in their structure, and so playing with the, with the expression of these different characters. One thing to keep in mind, of course, is that not all the wines will have that strong passion fruit character that a Sauvignon Blanc might have. So this compound might be less relevant in some wines, but in that same wine, these guys might be more relevant. So some wines will have a tendency to steer their development towards these guys, not good, and so there's countermeasures that you need to be taken. Some other wines might benefit from having as much as these guys as possible, and there, there will be actions that you need to do to ensure that that's the case. So if you take, for example, some of these wines that today on the market they're becoming quite popular, imagine the style of Sauvignon Blanc, modern New Zealand type of Sauvignon Blanc, very fruity. More and more we're looking at different wines, so not anymore Sauvignon Blancs, but they're still gravitating around the sensory spectrum that is very much characterized by these passion fruit aromas, citrusy, grapefruit aromas, even some Riesling from Germany now starting to, to move towards that style. And so these are the good guys, okay? The aroma compounds that play a role from this point of view are what I called before the good guys, for example, the mercaptoexanol. Now, these compounds during wine life in the bottle, inevitably, they're gonna fade away. They're gonna decrease. But one way for us, and we want to keep them as much as we can, of course, because they play this crucial role in the good quality side. So one side to ensure that is that we protect the wine in the bottle theoretically as much as we can from oxygen. If we were only looking at these compounds, we would want to give as little oxygen as possible. But depending on the wine, little oxygen can also help us support these complex mineral characters. But you remember already that these are in between the good guys and the bad guys, and so they might not need to be fully protected to go to this level, but you want to be in this sort of protective side of things. But if you go too much in the protective side of things, that's where you're going to get the big guys. So anything you do to really protect these good guys in your wine will expose you to the risk of having the bad guys coming along. And we've seen this chemically quite often. Uh, the, what I said before was more a theoretical situation, but if we look at some studies that we did, you see that if you plot the good guys against the bad guys, they're quite well connected. So anything you do to try and protect the good guys in the wines 
It's going to expose you, as I say, to the risk of increasing the concentration and the presence of the bad guys with the possible sensory implications that these guys will have. We also see some uh, outlaws, if you want to stay along the lines of the joke, or outliers. So some wines that don't behave, don't stick to this very neat correspondence. We all know that wines are variable, and in fact the complexity of what we deal with is just the complexity of wine variability. But we do observe wines that have a tendency, as I said, no matter what you do, to develop this reductive character. So these are the wines that you really want to do to have some countermeasures in terms of how to bottle them and how to uh, seal the bottles so that you prevent this excessive buildup of reductive compounds. Very much seem to be linked to variety, and we're still trying to understand which are the varieties that are more prone to reduction. But there's a strong winemaking component in this. And some of our studies are pointing out at some specific winery or winery practices that seem to bring out this character of the wine to express re reductive aromas. For example, there's been over the last 15 years a lot of work around reductive winemaking. Winemaking operations, a series, putting together winemaking protocols that are really protecting wine from oxygen. And in particular, in the case of white wine, we see more and more people talking about adding glutathione to wines. Glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant. It's capable of blocking the natural oxidation reactions that are happening in wine. But by doing so, it will also protect the sulfur compounds because the loss of these sulfur compounds is mainly linked to oxidation reactions. So preventing oxidation in the bottle means protecting these guys, as we say. So some wines where we add this glutathione, for example, or where we take a lot of this antioxidant careful protection, they tend to retain the fruity aromas quite well in the bottle. So they don't, the wines that don't have a problem of premature loss of these fruity aromas. The problem they have, though, is that they build up more likely to build up the reductive aromas. So these are the wines where you want to use a closure that allows a sufficient amount of oxygen in the bottle to prevent this because you don't have this problem really intrinsically in the wine. The other scenario are wines that are more prone to this risk, so to lose the fruity aromas. So in that case, you want to use a closure that protects the wine from oxygen because your main problem in that case is the premature loss of the fruity varietal aromas. So this is one scenario where the outlier comes into play. So wines that are not behaving in a sort of smooth way, but need special attention. But generally speaking, it's always along this balance that one of the criteria to choose the right closure will revolve around. So more oxygen when you're more concerned with reduction and based on your experience, your knowledge of your wines, that's where the risk is bigger. And less oxygen when you have wines, that big problem there is their fragility, their rapid loss of fruity aromas, the likelihood to become less interesting over a short period of time. So this is quite in general when we talk about more or less oxygen. That's one way when we approach things. But the reality today is that we, we're slicing oxygen contribution of the closure to a level where we, we're now going down to the milligrams and less than a milligram over a year. We, able, we have closures on the market that will allow you to make that choice. How much do I want? One milligram or two milligrams or half a milligram over a year. So how, how does it work? And I mean, we work quite a bit on that because uh, we, we pride ourselves in Normacoke as being able to put together a series of closures that are very, very discreet and precise in the delivery of oxygen. So why we think it's important to be that precise? If you look at a study we did uh, some years ago when I was at AWRI, we had a Sauvignon Blanc aged for 12 months in a bottle. And we had two closures, so that's the same wine, two closures, one of which delivered about half a milligram over the 12 months that the wine sat in the bottle, and the other one delivered twice as much, 1.2 milligrams. And you see this difference was enough to split the wine in two different categories as far as reduction versus the fruity aromas go. So again, as far as the good guys versus the bad guys go, that's enough to create the split. More recently, we had a wine bottled in uh, Hungary 
where we had uh, two closures again over six months. One closure had delivered, again, roughly that same amount of oxygen, 0.6. The other one, but twice as much. And you see that the preference was 50-50. So we could create wines that were different. The bloggers, this was at a bloggers conference last year, so people from the media, they could pick the difference. Everybody agreed the wines were different but the preference was 50-50. Uh, so that tells us two things. This apparently relatively small difference in oxygen exposure are enough to create different wine styles. So that's why we believe it's important to be precise about how much, closure, how much oxygen a closure is bringing in the picture. But it also tells you that there isn't one closure that will deliver the wine that can be preferred by the majority of the consumers, or in this case, by uh, journalists, wine experts, if you want. The preference is going to be split. Here we had a little part of the audience saying, look, I'll prefer overall the wine that has received less oxygen, but it feels a bit reduced to me, so there's a bit of reduction creeping in. But overall, the preference was nearly 50-50. So not always the closure that delivers the lowest oxygen, even in the case of a Sauvignon Blanc, is the preferred one. And same story in another study we did on a Shiraz wines when I was again in Australia. We had, in this case, a fully descriptive analysis, so you see uh, quite a range of sensory descriptors. We had three levels of oxygen that the wine had received over 20 months in the bottle. And you see when you have uh, 1.6 milligrams, which is, by the way, more than what today you will have over 20 months with a screw cap, you'll be gravitating a lot towards uh, the bad guys. Sewage, rubber, egg, not nice. You doubled it up and still in a Shiraz, in a big red wine, it might not be enough to really move away from that reductive spectrum. And you really need to get much higher if you want to start really getting away from those aroma attributes and expressing a bit of the fruity aromas in a more clear way. So again, the oxygen spectrum is probably getting a little bit broader in a red wine. These are wines that will need a bit more oxygen to develop. Certainly, their structure is more important than a Sauvignon Blanc. But again, the differences cannot be huge, and you still have to be quite, quite careful and quite uh, informed about your choices in terms of the right closure that will allow you to deliver the wine with the best sensory profile. But we heard before that there is also a risk of, uh, I called it here, going to the dark side. So dark side meaning where you think you'll be getting something. So you do all your evaluation. You think, I'm going to choose this closure because... Uh, Overall, is a closure that has a low oxygen ingress, so that's enough for me, or is a high oxygen ingress, so that's enough for me. But then you actually get something else after a period in the bottle. So you start with the cookies, and you get another type of cookies here. And you hear during the day that there's various reasons for that. One is that, as we said, heard already before, but you hear more about it. If you don't control oxygen at bottling, very little differences in the oxygen contribution that is the closure will not make any sense anymore because there could be too much variation to begin with to cover, that will cover anything else. But the other part of the story is that it's not enough to choose to decide how much oxygen you think your wine needs. It's also important to ensure that the closure you choose to deliver that amount of oxygen will deliver it in a constant way. So it's not, it's not gonna work if you then realize later that that closure from single closure to another closure in the same batch is varying significantly the oxygen contribution, the oxygen ingress, and also from a batch to another, you should still be able to stick to the same oxygen level once you've chosen that that's the one that works for your wine. And you hear during the day that obviously Closure is one big part of the oxygen story, but it's not the only one because you can, as you've seen before already also in the slide where things are going, there's an ideal exposure, but there's a bit all over the place. Oxygen can come into play during fermentation maceration, during microoxygenation for reds, during pressing crushing, very important for reds and whites. So once you start to think about oxygen, think about the whole winemaking series of operations that you do in the winery. And the contribution of oxygen, it changes depending on the wines and the type of varieties and the, the conditions that you operate against. But we realize more and more that this is a very, very important player in the final quality that you deliver to your consumers. Obviously, there's always oxidation at the other end of the spectrum. 
and I went in the literature and picked a few studies. There's not a lot of studies, believe it or not, that will tell you how much oxygen has been given to a wine and how the sensory spectrum of the wine developed. So there's a lot of anecdotal perception, but there's not a lot of studies. So I went in the literature, picked a few that I could trust. Two were from us, actually, by the way, done with an institute in France. And you see that, for example, in a study we did on Grenache red wine over 10 months in the bottle, we went from uh, uh, an oxygen exposure in the bottle, so through the closure that were pretty low, and so the wines were strongly expressing reductive attributes. Somewhere around five, six milligrams per liter over 10 months was really nice in bringing out the nice red fruits. And then you start getting a caramel character that some people might like, but it's a level of complexity that is maybe already gravitating towards oxidative uh, sensory characters. Again, in a study on rosé wines, same thing is between three and six that the nice characters are coming out. Over 10 months again, three and six milligrams per liter. Took another study, not from us, on a Sauvignon Blanc, where you see that over 24 months is um, between three and five that the nice sensory characters are coming out. Below that, you have too much reduction Probably somewhere, somewhere in between is pretty good as well because you see around three, you probably still have some reduction. But they didn't have that, uh, they didn't cover that range. They went to a much higher oxygen exposure that obviously puts the ones towards oxidative mode. But things are happening in this range. This is the range where we think we should slice down oxygen ingress uh, properties of a closure and deliver a line of closures that will allow winemakers to be gravitating around here so that they can choose between, this, between the characters that they want to be, bring out, but still staying away from reduction of oxidation. And so you see that our select, our latest generation of products is really designed with this experience in mind, which as you can see is not only our experience, but it seems to fit pretty well with the few other studies that are out there, done reasonably well to give this level of depth and information. So see closures that over 20 months will deliver these amounts of, one, of oxygen will allow you to be in the, in the nice sides of wine sensory spectrum. So my conclusion can really make a lot of difference to the quality of your wine, how much oxygen it receives in the bottle, not only in terms of avoiding faults, but also creating different wine styles. Just to simplify a lot of complex chemical things, one thing that we observe a lot, because as I said, you can bring oxygen in the picture at different stages. But the way it's so effective in the bottle is that a lot of the changes that will happen, especially as far as reduction is concerned, are happening in the bottle. You bottle a wine that is clean, and then it turns out to be reductive after a period in the bottle. So you want to have oxygen coming in at that part of the story to bring its contribution. There's less impact in having oxygen at mass preparation as far as reduction in the bottle is concerned. And obviously, once you find out that this works for your wine, uh, then you, you would have chosen a, an OTR, an oxygen ingress level that works for you. But you need to make sure that this is consistent across different batches and across different closures so that you, you eliminate that level of variation. I know that people in the wine industry, we have a, a, a culture of cultivating a little bit of diversity and the sort of um, unpredictable element but I think there's enough unpredictability with vintage, varieties, winemaking. We don't, risk, we don't run the risk of getting bored with, with wines, I think. But it's probably more risk losing your customers because one day he went to the bottle shop, he bought a bottle, it was excellent. He went there, back, he bought two cases, and the wine was all over the place. So uh, that's very much where these things are coming to play. So, once you find out that it works for the style of your wine, you have to make sure that you stick to that so that the ingredients you use, in this case the closure, are really the same ingredient all the time. So that was it for me, and I'll leave the floor to Professor Waterhouse, which I don't think it needs any introduction as we're here in California. So I'll just let it to Andy.